Okay, so from, from one book that made me cry to another book that made me cry, um, that was just incredible. Um, thank you so much. So, Kerry Hudson. I first learned of her with her novel, and when I heard she was writing a memoir, I couldn't wait to get my hands on it. But I was also terrified um, because it was going to take me to places I'd not been for a long time, too. Kerry attended nine primary schools and five secondary schools, living in bed and breakfasts and council flats as her and her mum were forced to move again and again by poverty and its associated evils. Kerry is now a rightly acclaimed novelist, activist and columnist, and her life is mostly unrecognisable. But how did she get from there to here? And is her journey complete? What happened to the places and some of the people that she left behind? Lowborn is a memoir like no other and speaks to me as few books ever have done. It is essential reading for our times and the statistical chances of two people like Kerry and I being on a similar journey and sharing a stage at the Savoy 30 years later <laughs> are minimal. <laughs> Thank you and please join me in welcoming Kerry Hudson. Hiya. Hello, Not bad. <laughs> um, you're going to read it with, a long way from Motherwell, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. There you go, there is um, your wonderful book. So not only was I late, but I also forgot my reading copy. Um, <laughs> I'll make up for it with the reading. Uh, so I thought I'd read a little bit from the introduction, which I feel uh, kind of gives you a nice sort of entry into the book and the story. Shall we start with a happy ending? I made it. I rose. I escaped poverty. I escaped bad food because that's all you can afford. I escaped threadbare clothes and too tight shoes. I escaped drinking and drugging myself into oblivion because, because. I probably escaped early mortality rates and preventable diseases. We'll see. I escaped the higher rate of domestic abuse. I escaped sink estates, burnt out houses, and ice cream vans at the school gate selling drugs. I escaped Jeremy Kyle in a shiny suit, telling me <laughs> my sort is scum. Um, as an aside, the week this was published, Jeremy Kyle got taken off air. And <laughs> is there a nicer thing than that? I don't think so. <laughs> I feel like a witch. <laughs> I escaped casual, <laughs> grim violence fueled by frustration and special brew. I escaped benefits queues and means assessments and shitty zero-hour contracts. I escaped hopelessness. I've lived more of that life, my first 20 years, than I've lived of this infinitely cushier one since. And the names still ring in my head every day. Chav, Scav, Lowlife, Ned, Underclass, lowborn. Yeah, I might have been lowborn, but somehow I ascended. I reached up high enough to write these words and believe someone might read them. Now I eat well and I always have somewhere decent to stay. My clothes are cheap, but I can afford to replace them. I enjoy the luxury of exercise. I heat my flat in the winter. I have access to art, music, film, and books, and they don't feel like things for other people. When I've been unwell in mind or body, I've sought help, it's been given, and I've got better. I've traveled the world and made a living doing what I love, which also happens to be the preserve of people not like me and us in this <laughs> case. But now, let's go back to the beginning. One single mother, two stays in foster care, nine primary schools, one sexual abuse child protection inquiry, five high schools, two sexual assaults, one rape, two abortions, my 18th birthday. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Questionnaire asks 10 questions to measure childhood trauma, and each affirmative answer gives you a point. Research has shown that an individual with an A score of four or higher is 260% more likely to have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease than someone with a score of zero, 240% more likely to contract hepatitis, 
460% more likely to experience depression, and 1,220% more likely to attempt suicide. I scored eight. It might be easier to believe that I was somehow unlucky, that I was a terrible exception. But the truth is, the people I grew up with experienced much of the same, a little less sometimes, often a lot more. The difference for me, I saw something on the horizon and I ran. I ran and never looked over my shoulder. I am proudly working class, and in this socially mobile hinterland I currently occupy, I miss the sense of community that my tribe might provide me. But I was never proudly poor. True poverty is all-encompassing, grinding, brutal, and often dehumanizing. I think it goes without saying that the knowing shame and fear of poverty is not something I have ever missed particularly since I still frequently experience its aftershocks. That's little. Uh, if Janine's book and film are going to be seen and read by everybody in Congress, I think everybody in Parliament um, should read this book. Yeah. Um, it's, it's that important. It's the, it, it's the first memoir I've read, um, apart from my own, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that talks about the, the, the themes um, and, the, and the world that takes us back to those rooms that are not heated, where there's no carpets, where there's sometimes no door, where there's mm. chaos and danger. And, you know, you take, us, you take us there, and we go there with you as the reader, and you do it in beautiful prose. Um, it's a beautifully written book. Um, but it's a dangerous book to read, and I, I think a dangerous book to, for you to have written. Yeah, I mean, enormously, enormously <laughs> risky. Um, I, I should say, first of all, that I have to thank Damien, you for Maggie and me, which I really feel was like a sort of a path trailblazer for this sort of book. I'm not sure I would have gotten this. Really? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I really do believe that. Um, and I'm so glad that it exists and that we're here on this stage together, which I think is kind of remarkable. Two council estate kids from Motherwell on the stage of the Savoy. <laughs> Get up, yeah, elitism. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, are you going to get gonna invited back to the Savoy? Sorry, no, no. <laughs> no I, I, I We've still got Janine's it, it, tissue, it, it, we're all right. <laughs> Janine's body warmed <laughs> tissue. Um, the, it's, uh, a dangerous book for you to have, to have written, and I wondered why, why you chose to write it. You'd written a novel before, which is sort of semi-autobiographical, yeah. incorporated some of these things, but you know, why, why write this memoir at this place in your life now? I mean, t two reasons. One was like very political. I've always been a very political writer. I think my novels are, are quite deeply political too. Mm. And when I decided to write it, Trump had just got in, Brexit had just got happened. I was seeing the most disgusting, divisive narrative around poor people on TV and the press. And I knew that was because it was being made by people who had never experienced poverty, mm. who had maybe never even met someone who'd experienced poverty, who were then parachuting into these places, creating media that was then consumed by other people who then went and repeated that cycle. Mm. And I was really angry and I was trying to figure out what I could do. And I realized that one of the things I had to offer was my own lived experience and this little platform I carved out from my novel writing. Um, and then I'm obviously deeply self-involved, like most writers. So I also had um, this other motivation, which is that I did feel like I was living in this hinterland, this socially mobile hinterland. I couldn't go home, or at least I didn't think so. Actually, the book showed me different things. Mm. And um, I was never totally comfortable in sort of uh, the, the world I was occupying. I was always aware that I was slightly alien or different. Um, and so this was a way of me trying to reconcile those two halves of my life. There is a loss involved in writing a book like this, um, which is that you can no longer class pass. I refuse to say class pass. Um, <laughs> you, you, you know, and you talk about it brilliantly in, in Lowborn. You talk about it, you say, you know, you go, you do the deal with your publisher. And of course, this is based on a series of columns as well that were in the, the, the pool. Um, much missed, and um, you, you, know, you, you go there, you do it all, you should be jubilant, you should be excited, and yet at that moment you suddenly realise that everybody's going to know. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I mean, I don't, it's so funny telling Damien that memoir is exposing. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it is. I mean, uh, like, and I think, I, I mean, I, everyone knew I was working class. Like, I'd been, yeah. uh, like, an activist and sort of working class issues. No, but I mean, in terms of time. people just meeting you for the first time yeah. who didn't, they, and it's, you've written about it, it's all there. Yeah, and even then, I mean, I think people don't, don't always recognise the the reality of what you say when you say working class. Mm. Uh, for me, I should say there's obviously a spectrum of working class experience mm -hmm. and mine, and I think it's safe to say yours was quite at the extreme end of it. But um, but yeah, I mean, it was a it was sort of a radical form of honesty for me. I will say it's been hugely liberating though. Yeah. It's exhausting to go through your life wearing the clothes that, that the people around you expect you to wear yeah. and behaving in a way that is not necessarily natural to you because you're constantly trying to play a part and pass. Um, yeah. So it's been lovely not to have to do that anymore. So it's kind of liberating. I remember when I, when I joined the Times at, out of university and uh, people would ask me what school I'd gone to and I'd tell them Brannock and they'd think it was some terribly <laughs> exclusive small private school that they'd not heard of and I'd let that kind of like play in their mind and then I'd say it's the state school and watch them come and be like oh my god you know how did he get in um but um but 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 you know that, that you know that, that there is a kind of energy that is expended that, that you describe really well in the book and it's not that you're trying to fake it it's not that you're lying it's it's that you're you're in one you're in one place or the you're not in one place or the other um and I think you write about that very well, and you also write about the loss that social mobility involves, which which is never talked about ever. The idea that you know you you, you as you said just then you leave behind this tribe. You you, 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 make, you do these huge sacrifices, and often like young people don't have any options. So for the book, as well as. Um, writing about my own sort of upbringing in poverty, I returned to all the towns that we grew up in, which was all the way from Aberdeen down to Norfolk, all uh, very deprived towns, post-industrial, um, and um, I met young people who said, I'm going to have to leave, you know, I, there are no opportunities for me here, and there really weren't, but the sacrifice involved in that, mm. the sort of severing of all that community, and the alienation from their family, I speak to a lot of young people who now feel really alienated from their families that they left back home, but they've had no choice, mm. um, it's, it's, and I really acutely felt that sacrifice, um, which is why it was such a gift going back to those towns, and actually being welcomed warmly back to those communities overall. How did you decide in which order to visit them? And how did you get yourself ready to do it? Um, it, was, it was pretty, so sometimes I was working in that part of the, so I meant to do it chronologically in the end. Sometimes I was up in Glasgow for something anyway, so it made sense to go back to Coatbridge and Motherwell and yeah. Airdrie. Um, so it was fairly arbitrary. Um, it was a pretty terrifying year, you know. Nobody's ever like, I'm going to go back to my old town and I'm going to dig up all my old skeletons and then I'm going to talk to strangers and then I'm going to write that book <laughs> and then I'm going to put it into the world for everyone to hear. Um, so, I mean, nobody does that with sort of a faint heart, I think. So I knew it was... But I really, and still do, you know, the, the value has been enormous. For me as a person, it's been genuinely life-changing. Um, and I really feel... I know because I get messages from readers all the time that there are so many people who don't even have this sort of extreme experience of working class life or aren't even working class, but who recognise what I'm talking about and it's mirrored some of their experience. And that, I think, is the greatest thing you can hope for as a writer, is to reach people and see, see them affected by your work. Mm. Um, as it's the place that we share, can we talk about going back to Lanarkshire? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Nobody's ever made that dreamy sound about Lanarkshire. Before. <laughs> <laughs> but when I went back, I just, I, I was just amazed by the yeah. community spirit. I mean, yeah. it was astounding. No, d talk about it because you know, you, is that where you go to the food bank, or yes. is that yeah? yeah I mean, yeah. that you know, they didn't exist. There were no food banks when when we yeah. were growing up there. Um, I'm not saying they're a wonderful innovation in the manner of Jacob E. Smog, um, <laughs> or that it's very heartening to see people using them. It's a disgrace. Uh, but, they, but, they, but they didn't exist, and the people you met there were amazing, weren't they? Incredible. I mean, what I find in almost all the communities I went, but especially in North Lanarkshire, were local people who had been through hardship themselves, whether that was addiction or hunger or um, you know, any other sort of social issue, who understood the problem and so knew the most effective solution to fix it. Mm. So I saw these 
amazing people, just really normal people, um, basically like mending the social welfare nets on their own time. Uh, one woman was a breast cancer survivor who found out a kid didn't have a winter coat. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't actually in the book, it didn't make it in sadly. Uh, she found out a kid didn't have a winter coat and so she was outraged by this. She was in her 60s, she was a grandma. And so she put a call out on Facebook and said, "This we can't have children in Scotland with no winter coats. And then she managed to get somehow, her and her three sisters managed to get 500 complete school uniforms, one for every kid who needed it Amazing. in the region. And she was just, she was in a twin set. She had pearl earrings, you know? She's like, well, we just needed to do it, you know? And that was, that sort of like grassroots community activism, I thought was astounding. And those towns have been like just shat on from the highest height. Sorry, beautiful Savoy for yeah. <laughs> ruining your, your classiness. No, you're not but, ruining um, it. And, you're adding and, to it. <laughs> but, um, and, still, and still those people just found a way to make it work and to keep the community going. It was beautiful. And how do you think it had changed and how, since, you'd, since you'd been there? Had things, do you felt, had they got better? Had they got, had they got worse? Was it a combination of those things? Um, I mean... Overall, it felt like a lot had not changed at all. So, for instance, yeah. I went back to all my old council houses. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I got invited in for a cup of tea. And, um, and what I was amazed by was just, I don't know if you've been back to yours, oh, but, but they haven't, they just haven't changed. Mm. I mean, I could literally, I could remember routes that I'd taken when I was five years old because all the landmarks, everything was a bit more faded, but uh -huh. obviously no regeneration had gone into those places, not even at Aberdeen where money had like flooded into the town. Yeah. Um, but not to the I, bit of town that you were in. Not to Torrey, didn't not make it over Torrey. the river, yeah. No. Um, but, um, but what I found was that people were really struggling because of austerity measures, because of sanctions, because of uh, the, the erosion of social housing stock. Mm. Um, so, so even though things were really hard when I was growing up, there was a welfare state there, and it was somewhat nurturing. I was able to go to college because I was able to get job seekers. Mm. Those things do not exist for people now. And so the benefit system is so incredibly harsh and penalizing that it's making it so hard for people to even make a tiny step up. Um, I, I went back reasonably recently um, with a film production company and they're making, because they're making a TV series of Maggie and Me, and I went with this, um, uh, producer um, and person to my school, uh, which was open on a Saturday. Open on a Saturday because uh, it was a club to feed kids who weren't going to get fed because that was a day where there was no school dinners. So they, they, they started a lunch club and I was struck by how many of the children in that club were gay. And you could just tell, cause, and they just didn't <laughs> want to be at home, and you could just tell. And they were there, and things had changed, so there was a big rainbow flag in the foyer, and that was different, because the foyer is where I used to get beaten up for being gay. <laughs> that would probably still happen, but at least they'd be told off now. Um, and, um, and I made my way along the corridors, which had not changed, but I was taller, and I used to touch both sides of them, and I, I could touch both sides of them, and I went into... Um, all, all around the school, and I took these people all around the school, and they, I was just sort of kind of excited, nostalgic. I don't know how often you felt that when you were going back to places, but I was just sort of, I felt welcomed back in a sense by the place. Um, and they were sort of horrified by it. Um, and what horrified was them was that they said, it's just like it is in your book. And I said, well, I'm glad. Yeah, that's yeah. good, is it not? You know, and, and they were like, no, it means nothing has changed. It means there's been no money spent, no regeneration, like you've just said. Um, and I think that's the thing that shocks me when, when I go back, when I think how quickly Brighton changes where I live now compared to those, those places. They, they, do, they do change and they, and they don't change. And they don't change in the ways that they should. Um, one, of the, one of the things that happened to you as, as a teenager is that you've weirdly found God. <laughs> I did indeed, yes. They, I wonder, because were you in Motherwell? Yeah. So, yeah, it wasn't the King's Church, was it? The Evangelical King's Church. The big Church. red brick one. No, we yeah. were the same. Yeah. We were at the same. We can probably get up right now and do your really amazing version of We probably Jesus can, but we won't. We, 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 but we, were, we, were, we are the same age. Yeah. yeah. So, so do you I think we were there at the same time? Oh. Being saved, but not really. I, <laughs> 
<laughs> we got saved fine. Look at us up here. Uh, <laughs> that's astounding. Yeah. Um, it was, so we should explain. So, so it was an evangelical church on an American model yeah. that went out and recruited kids from the poorest areas. And at first, it was really nice because you had these like very warm parental figures who gave you cuddles. There were always biscuits. Um, but what, in my case, they hadn't reckoned on is that we're still kids from rough estates. So we spent all of our weekends getting really stoned and drunk before we sort of rolled up to church. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think I, I think after a while they were just like we're done with you guys like you're just you're unsavable basically, but um, but they had huge protests afterwards because what they realised was that, that what they were doing was was kind of manipulative and yeah. so there were protests in the local area. Actually, I didn't about know them. about that. I didn't know about the protests. Quite a few years later. I mean, I remember when they came when they came to our school and as part of the Scripture Union movement. I mean, I was <laughs> so into it. Um, I loved it because I was like, wow, this, is, this Bible is a really good novel. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, it just, and I loved it. But, and, but for me, it was, the, it was the gayness. It was the, well, not the gayness, actually, the homophobia. Um, it was the, you know, the one thing the Protestants and the Catholics could agree on. Because they didn't, <laughs> didn't like the gays. Um, and, so, and, so, and so that was that. Um, but do you think there was broadly a difference between the places that you went back to in Scotland versus the places that you went back to in England, or do you think they were just this, the same in terms of how the communities were and, and how they were being treated? I mean, I, I definitely think, I mean, I've got to say, like, I just, I love Nicola Sturgeon. I think she's doing the best job she can. And I think broadly, like, social welfare policies are slightly better. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say on my visits I saw that, mm -hmm. but I feel like that, and I kind of, you know, um, the towns in England certainly were, were really, like, really, really struggling, hitting the hole, which is an ex-mining town, which had just been decimated by the closure of the mines. Great Yarmouth, an old seaside town. Mm. They've been through like five get-rich-quick schemes and the town's still languishing. And now it has a Tory local government that people are thinking might turn things around. You could not make that up in a novel. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, I feel like, I mean, certainly it felt to me that at least Scotland I believe cares about mm. its, its people who are mm. living in poverty, whether they're doing enough and mm. robustly enough, I don't know. But, um, but I really feel that the policies in England are, you know, are so, um, so cruel, so psychologically punishing to poor people now. Um, your, uh, your mum is one of the biggest characters in this book, uh, apart, from, apart from you. And it's clear to you how much you love her. Mm -hmm. And it's clear to us how much she loves you, but also how unable she is to give you what you, what you need. And you say in the book that you estranged yourself from her. Um, has she reached out to you since the book has been published in any, in any way? Has there oh been my any? Oh God, is she gonna come out from behind the curtain? No, she is not. <laughs> This is this, I, I this is not, not this is your life, that, the yeah. Ned, the Jeremy <laughs> Kyle edition. Um, no, she, she's not. Then we'll not. all take a lie detector test and see if I was telling the truth. You're my memoir. Um, no, and I think no. you know. I think what I thought really. I mean, I because your family were they did they were in touch with you when you were writing it. You had an uncle who got in touch with yeah, you. Yeah, so so I, I reconnected with a lot of my Aberdonian family who all turn out to be enormously political, uh, which I completely love. And they're this like huge clan. It's like it's like finding out you got like you're related to the Waltons. And and they're happy to have you up for dinner. It's quite amazing. And so that's been wonderful. I didn't ever think that would happen, to be honest. And I didn't want it to happen. No. But I did want to be, I mean, you'll know the, the ethical decisions you have to make when writing a memoir are so extreme. It's the hardest part of writing it, I think. And so I really want to make sure that I was as fair as I could be mm. and that I, I said everything that I needed to and wanted to. And I'm really glad you take it. And what I really wanted the reader to take away was, like, my mum did the best she could have possibly done mm. in in human difficulty, I think, and really did her best for us. And actually there were structural issues that meant that she was, she was always just gonna be on a back foot. Um, but, um, and the other reason that I decided to write about the estrangement is because I think it's still really taboo. I know a lot of people are, who are estranged from their family, but it's, it's like, it's shameful to talk about. Mm. People don't want to talk about it. And I think that's sad because there are people living with that complexity in their life who are having to hide it along with the complexity of having to live without mm. your family. So I really want to try and show a mirror to, to sort of that experience too. It's very clear to me reading it how much I mean, your mother loves you as much as Lydia loves Luca, as, as much as Agnes loves mm -hmm. her children in Maggie's book. And that's one of the things that, that links all three of the books. Um, I think that's why it's so sad um, for me that, 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 that it didn't work as a, family, as a family relationship. One of the things you wanted to research when you were writing this book was about having been taken 
into care. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. was, what was the experience of researching that like? I mean, the, the first thing that I actually discovered is how incredibly difficult it is to get your child protection records and how little thought's been gone into how you access it. So when I called about, you called up, I called up Aberdeen City Council, I was like, and I hadn't really told anyone I'd been in care before because it has all sorts of stigmas attached to it and it's kind of private. Obviously, I don't have any privacy anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I'm calling because I was in care between these years and these years. And they went, oh, hold the line. And then they did that 10 times. They passed me around so I had to say that every time with my heart thumping in my chest. The nice thing is that I've been able to contribute to research to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. And then Have it was you? only, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So it contributes to sort of service research, which means that hopefully they'll find a better pathway for people who might be very scared about getting their child protection documents um, uh, to access them. Um, and then eventually, the only there was a really long delay. And the reason that I got them in the end is because I said that I was a novelist for Random House and a journalist. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they were ponied up. They even waived my fee. Um, but it was really frightening, you know. And they come back. Um, they come back redacted. So there's huge chunks missing. Um, but what I think did, it was why. What? Because because they pertain to other people, right. so I guess they somebody goes through a censor goes through and decides whether it's my right to know those things or those people's right to privacy. Well, like your peer, like mum or, or or yeah, a lot to do with my mum and her medical situation. But obviously, a lot of that was the reason why I ended up in care. Yeah. I did manage to the bits that were redacted through a little bit of detective work with my family. I managed to find out, mm. um, but it was it was really important for me because um, you know like care is this sort of strange amorphous thing that happens to you and you're not necessarily equipped to process it so seeing those documents were was really really valuable to me and um, even though it was kind of like this I described it as like a bomb in an envelope you know <laughs> like just waiting to go off um, but I'm really glad I did it and I've since helped some helped other people in similar situation get their documents too. What are your memories of being in care? Um, I, I don't really have a lot, you know, like um, the, the thing that I always say is that my most profound memory or I've kind of invented it is of it kind of being the Bisto mum in a really clean kitchen, which I think is such a, a sweet childhood, you know, hmm. sort of sort of uh, sort of set that I've created for myself for that experience. Um, so I didn't have a lot. I had more memories actually of being taken away, which I think is kind of understandable because those hmm. are the, the, the more traumatic parts. Hmm. Um, there's a lot that's not in this book. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how much is not in it because you can't remember, you don't want to remember, or you do remember, and you don't want people to know. Uh, a bit from column A, a bit from column B, a bit from column C. Cathy Rensenbrink, I met her when I was just finishing the first draft, and she gave me the best advice for any memoirist, which was, you don't have to give them everything, you know? Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> don't. I, I, yeah. I will say, I, I feel like I gave a lot, and that's, I really didn't want to, I didn't want to do something and not be completely honest. If people are giving you their time and their thoughts and their energy, I feel like you have to give them something quite valuable. And I think I did that, but I did keep some things for myself, and I'm, uh, I'm glad I did that, you know, because I feel like you have to reserve a little part of yourself, especially when you're writing memoir, mm. because, um, because otherwise it's, it's very hard to keep a sense of yourself, I think. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I was given a good bit of advice by Susie Boyd, who wrote a memoir called mm. My Duty Girl on Life, which is brilliant, and she said, don't ever tell an editor anything you don't want to be put under pressure to see in your book. Um, and I, I thought about that, and I, I remember between the final draft of Maggie and Me and it being a galley, I lost about 20,000 words. Because mm. I thought, I just don't want people to know. Yeah. Like, they don't need to know, it's not essential to the story, I don't want them to know. Um, and I felt like I was making myself a hostage in a weird way to my past self. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. Um, I felt when I was writing that memoir, like I spent most of my life in the past um, and does that chime with you, your experience? Yeah, yeah, very much. It was a very, it was a very strange year. I mean, I really lived and breathed writing the book, and I was travelling around the world, around the world, around the country. I wish around the world. <laughs> if only, if only been brought up in LA and not Lanark. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the first two letters are the same. I mean, they're so broadly similar. <laughs> very similar. Uh, so uh, travelling around the country, I was also writing the pool column every yeah. every month. RIP the pool. It was amazing for me, and so I was really just living and breathing this book. But it, and also I was writing it at the same time. Mm. So it that was must have been really it was hard. really like a, a sort of uh, like a living project all the time and even as I was writing I didn't know how it was going to turn out because I had no idea how the next visit would go or how the uh, reconciliation with my family would go 
Um, so it was, but it was such an, in, I mean, I will say that it was very difficult, me and I, I'm sure my husband as well are very glad that I'm finished writing it. Um, but it was a really creative process as mm -hmm. well, one of the most creative things I've ever done actually, mm -hmm. because you're really taking yourself to, to the edge of, of what you're capable of doing. I definitely did with this. Oh, as a writer, you can see that on the page and it's very exciting to think about what um, you might write next. Can we talk a wee bit, just as we finish, about teachers? Yes. Um, because you had so many amazing heroic teachers. I know that there was a, a little teacher joy moment just last week, I think it was. <laughs> there was. It was, my, it was my birthday. So it was my birthday and I was doing Durham Literary Happy Festival. Happy birthday. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> And, um, and it was in Durham and uh, I had these really, I had this really inspirational school in the small ex-mining village, Hatton Le Hall, with these incredible teachers who were just so nurturing and amazing, uh, who I write about in the book. And eight of them came to the festival to see me afterwards. And then the main, they, they just all gave me cuddles and they went, we're so proud of you. We're so proud of who you've become. And I was, I mean, I just cried and cried. But it was, uh, you know, and actually I've got, uh, I also had a teacher in my late teens, Ian Gordon, who was a really radically political drama teacher who I'm still in touch with as well, who, and his wife. And like, I really, what I came to believe in the book really is that if you want to help kids who are very vulnerable, I think uh, good social workers and good teachers are kind of your first line of defense to support those children and help them reach their full potential. I'm so glad for those teachers and your life. It's an incredible book. Please join me in thanking Kerry Hudson. Yeah.